Happy evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Panda Venture Pace, as if I say, we extend warm welcome to this uh, uh, session on international taxation on Article 7, Business Profits. Today, the session we have among us CA PB Srinivasan. So, without much shadow, I request CA permission to invite and accompany our speaker, CA PB Srinivasan, onto the dais. I also request C. Parmeshu to present the floral bouquet as a welcome gesture. So, without hand, uh, before handing over the session to our speaker, I take this opportunity to formally introduce him. Uh, C. P. V. Stream is a senior vice president of corporate taxation. He is working with Vipro Limited, Bangalore, heading the corporate tax function for the past 17 years. He has over 29 years of hands-on experience in industry with regard to corporate tax complaints across tax jurisdictions including the US, Europe and Asia Pacific addressing structuring requirements, cross-border mergers, acquisitions, business reorganizations, transfer pricing, employee taxation, indirect taxes in India. He has a hands-on experience in philanthropy management and h &I family wealth management. He participated as a member of Emerging Issues Task Force on non resident Taxation formed by Ministry of Finance, Government of India and he was appointed an ESCOM representative for resolving issues in Japan tax treaty. He is nominated on the expert panel of the Working Group on Transfer Pricing and is the chairman of Indirect Taxation Committee of Bangalore Chamber of uh, Commerce and Industry he was a past chairman of State Taxes Committee of Bangalore Chamber of uh, uh, Commerce and Industry and he has contributed many papers and delivered lectures on international taxation issues at various forums. With this uh, brief introduction, I now ha I hand over the session to our speaker, CAPV Srinivasan. Thanks a lot. I am speaking for the second time in this series. So, it would go even without an introduction. So, <laughs> a small correction also. I am uh, uh, possibly sort of very early retirement from the group, effective first April. Though I continue to be an advisor, but now uh, I am more a freelancer uh, and uh, I also have some assignments with the group. Only for correction for the record, it doesn't make a difference on the rest of the attributes which I have to <clears throat> Yes, going to speak today on a subject which is called attribution of profits to PE. When we talk about attribution of profits, I presume there is a reasonable working knowledge as to what constitutes PE. I will not possibly today touch upon what constitutes PE because that is an extensive subject. Possibly it will require deliberations for three, three, three to four sessions like this because it is a very vast subject. Today I will deal with attribution. So if you have a PE, how to attribute profits? I think that is the issue which we will deal with. While dealing with it, I may even certain <coughs> deal with certain aspects of PE and see whether the proper attribution principles would work in respect of those aspects of the We have almost about two and a half hours to deliberate. Please intervene. My expression is not adequate or I have not communicated. I don't mind taking questions also in between. But if you have to enter into a debate, we will defer to the end. In the interest of time for everybody. Because we have to advance, I have got almost 49 slides and uh, I would like to cover as many of them as possible to leave a meaningful uh, session with all of us. <coughs> P is a threshold requirement. If the norm is red, does not have a PE in the other country. He carries on business and derives business profits. If there is no PE, there is no attribution. So it's a threshold, if I can say, minimum nexus. 
If there is no minimum nexus, no profits can be attributed. What would be the nexus? Those are all criteria of P. You can have a service P, you can have a fixed place of business, you can have an agency P, and so on and so forth. Those are all. How to create a P? What factors would create a P? You are not dealing with that. If you don't have a P, no profits can be attributed to the P. So the threshold requirement is that. Even if you look at the bilateral treaties, if you say business profits earned by a resident of one country are taxable in the other country only if the business is carried on through a permanent establishment. So if you don't have a P, you don't have taxable profits. <coughs> what is the equivalent of P in the domestic law? We have a concept called business connection and that is explained under 9.1 and is given under 9.1 a similar threshold. Whatever is found in P is more or less the same thing is found in business connection. Maybe some treaties give a little more faster explanation of a P, but business connection would encompass most of them, if not all of them. The requirement of P or the concept of P is a very well entrenched concept. That is, it's nothing new as we speak. Almost 120 years of this concept have last. The earliest concept of a P was found in 1899 and between Prussia and Austria and Greek uh, treaty. So you have got almost uh, say uh, 215 years of P as a concept. It has been developed from time to time. But 115 years it survived fairly well and there was not, uh, there were disputes were only whether the P existed or not was hardly a dispute, let me say. There used to be a dispute, but it used to get resolved. But the last 15 years, with digital economy coming in, the concept of P itself has become a challenge. This is what constitutes P itself becomes a slightly, a slightly different a difficult determination. So I will say what lasted for 100 years very easily, the last 15 years has come for a great amount of difficulty in interpretation. That is about P itself, but as far as attribution is concerned, has still progressed in predictable lines. So we'll talk about attribution in a little more detail. All versions of OECD convention, right from the inception, all of them have uh, P attribution principle, what is called Article 7 in the model convention. And it's found that all conventions of UN also have concepts of P and the attribution, and therefore it is also nothing to be good. So when the right to tax, whatever is the right state, the source state, if I may say, source country or the source state, it is circumscribed by the profits attributable to that. So you must find the profits and only the profits can be subject to tax. So the sourcing principle can travel in two ways. The source can be the gross income or the source can be the net income. When you start, talk about fees for technical services, or when you talk about interest, or when you talk about royalties, it is usually the gross income which is subject to tax, maybe through a withholding process or so on. But when it comes to PE, it is not the gross income which is, the, the, though the source may be the income, may be the gross income, but what should be taxed is only the net profits and not the gross income. So you find, Right to tax subscribed by the right to all the profits attributable to the PE. So profit itself means there's an income and there's an expenditure. Of course, there are many methods of computing profit. It could be even ad hocly computed. So automatically profits means the net result and is not the gross result which will be liable to tax. Just here, yeah, nomenclature. I saw why I don't want to deal with P is that there could be many of them under each one of the categories. There could be a fixed place of business. It is associated with geographical location. That could be physical presence. For example, I am going to the US performing some activity. There's a physical presence. So once a physical presence is there, that could be a P. The duration of physical presence will determine whether it's a P or that's no P. Nature and level of activity, certain activity, for example, agency is a level uh, activity that could cause. In certain countries, you may find even the volume of business 
or the business income which is generated that will also be considered as a concept of P. So you may have certain attributes which are very well known to us like the fixed place of business, agency, service P, installation P, equipment P and so on and so forth. We may have another attribute which is called the volume of business which is carried on and that alone can create certain amount of P. For example, just to highlight, the digital economy people are talking about today, they say the volume or the amount of gigabytes or something which gets generated in the country or the digital footprint which is there, that itself may be an attribute for causing an amount of P. Certain times mere volume in currency terms also could cause a break. We don't have those kinds of P in India, you are in any of the treaties, but slowly that also may emerge at some point in time. So, if I have to find, Nexus rules are used to determine whether a non-residence connections are adequate to be having a, some kind of a justification for taxes. So, the first Nexus, if you have the Nexus, and then set the adequate nexus for justifying a taxation, next only the next person. Nexus rules do not deal with what amount of non-residence income should be liable to tax. So it only says, all the treaties you read, it talks about permanent establishment, there is a detailed listing of what constitutes permanent reception. But when you slip to the article 7, it only says the profits are attributable to the permanent establishment. So what amount of income should be liable to tax that is not discussed in any treaty. What is discussed is what constitutes the excess. So you have to find out that if something is not even defined but is only laid down as a principle or a guiding uh, parameter that the amounts attributable to the nexus alone is liable to tax then we have to find out what is the under international understanding of what is the amount of income that would be liable to tax. So P is used to adopt levy and collect the tax. So a non-resident who does not have a P, there is no mechanism to levy and collect. If there is a P, there is an automatic mechanism to levy and collect the tax. So the P is also a mechanism to collect the tax. So there is a P which will be liable to tax, is the P who will be liable to assist, is the P which has to file the return. Now non-resident by itself is not required to file a return if he does not have a PE. So is the PE which is for example in Indian context, a foreign company's branch, a company incorporated outside India, if it has got a branch in India, it will, got, it will be called a foreign company and the foreign company will be required to file a tax return in respect of its operations of the foreign company in India, nothing more than that. So there is no need to apply the source and computational rules for non-residents who does not have a P or the nexus. If you don't have a nexus, you don't have to go and find out whether the income is sourced in India or it is uh, what is the computation of the income in case it is sourced in India. So this is the consequence of that. So with these fundamental principles, the next question is when I talk about P and attribution of profits, profits would come in so many forms, but it is not all profits which are not liable to tax under Article 7. The profit should be business profits. So we must know what is business and what would be the profit arising out of business. If the income is not in the nature of business profits, it may not be covered under Article 7. It could be covered under any other article depending on the nature of income. But to start with, we must know what is business and therefore what is the profits arising out of the business. If I say income earning activities that are characterized as business alone would be liable to charge under Article 7. What is business? Is there a treaty meaning? Treaty does not give a meaning. When treaty does not give a meaning, what is the way to interpret the law? It will say that you have to go into the domestic law to see whether the term is defined. The term business is defined in the domestic law, section 2, subsection 13, defines business includes any trade, commerce or manufacture or any adventure or concern in the nature of trade, commerce or manufacture. 
there are enough rulings on what constitutes business. Even a single adventure may constitute a business in certain circumstances. I will not go into the expanse meaning of business, but an activity which is regularly carried on with the uh, desire to earn profits that would constitute a business in this context. So you have a business and therefore you have to find it out. Whenever there's a PE, the, there may be business, but whether to tax or not, the threshold has to be defined, defined by the country. It could be defined in the domestic law or it could be defined through treaty mechanism. The domestic law may be tighter while the treaty may be narrower, but if the domestic law is wider, uh, narrower and the treaty is tighter, it could not make a difference because you can always benefit from the domestic law. So the country must choose to find out what is the threshold it will possibly adopt. For example, you will find in all the treaties, no profits, you will find the underlying one, no profits shall be attributed to a PE by reason of mere purchase by the PE of goods or merchandise for the enterprise. That means mere purchase activity, no doubt it is a permanent establishment strictly because it's carrying on business, purchase is also part of the business. So somebody can say even purchasing activity is a PE, but all that is saying that it may be a PE for a moment, whether it's called a PE or not, even then no profit shall be attributed because there is a threshold. But the threshold the country chooses not to tax because he feels that that threshold is not what it would like to tax. So a purchase activity is excluded for the simple reason that you could allow purchase activity. It is a sourcing principle. You, when you allow purchase to economically, when you allow a foreign enterprise to source purchases from India, you are allowing economic prosperity for the country. So the country may not to choose to tax the purchasing activity in India. So that's the way it works. So you have a nexus, but that nexus the country chooses not to tax. Then you have rules for finding out what is the geographical rules you will have, then you will have allocation rules. So this is how the structure is made once the T is there. So again, I would possibly say the computation rules are different from sourcing rules. I may say that the income which is sourced in India, for example, agency P, an agency P actually represents the foreign enterprise and selling goods and merchandise in India, therefore there's an agency P for a moment. It has the ability to conclude contracts, it has contractual capabilities, all those things. So the sourcing rules will say that the entire sales income is sourced through the P. But the computational rules will work what will guide, not the sourcing rules. Because sourcing the entire source of income may be the sales. But what is important is the competition aspect. Therefore, only the profits would be liable to tax. So computational rules will deal with three aspects. Amounts which are to be included in the income. When I say income here, it's the gross income is the way we have to look at. Unless there is no difference between the gross income and the net income. Then amounts which are deductible in computing the income <coughs> and the timing of such inclusions and exclusions. For example, in the morning, just a, a session before those who were present who saw ICDS. What is ICDS trying to do? It is trying to advance the income and defer the expenses. So the computational mechanism is defined by ICDS. The income gets advanced and the expenditure gets deferred. Therefore, there is a higher profit which may be reported using ICDS till the equalization effect takes place after some point in time. So you have three aspects to be looked at in computation rules. The amounts which have to be included in the income, the amounts which are eligible for deduction and the amounts of timing of such income and deductions. I can give an example. If prop PE is the one, the treaty says profits attributable to the PE is the one which is liable to tax. Is it commercial profits or is the profits which has to be determined as per the domestic law? When I say profits to be determined as per the domestic law, 40A1 will apply, 43B will apply. 
So all those provisions from 28 to 44 or so, the, all of them will apply. If that were to be so, all of them would also apply to the P profits competition. So it is not the commercial profits which is intended to be taxed, it is the profits computed as per the provisions of the domestic law which is intended to be taxed. When profits are computed under the domestic law, you may find that certain expenses are not allowed in the year in which you want to claim them. Certain income may be taxed in advance than how you are accounted for. So you will find certain vagaries or variances to the way you are accounted. Normally, a country will not discriminate a non-resident from a resident in the competition mechanism. It would not discriminate on anything. It may give an advantage to a non-resident, but it would not put a disadvantage to a non-resident. So the computational provisions for a non-resident will be either equal or beneficial. It will not be disadvantage. If it is not, if it is a disadvantage, you can invoke the non-discrimination class under the treaty and seek parity. So you can find that the computational mechanism for resident and non-resident in most countries is the same. You will not find it. So how, whatever is the method you adopt for computing income under the domestic rules for our domestic companies, the same rules you will apply for computing the PE profits. That could be special favorable environment, that's what I talked about. That could be less rigorous for a non-resident. There are certain ad hoc measures to compute. That, that could be presumptive tax for a non-resident which could be beneficially given to him. But ordinarily it will not be made a discrimination. For example, in recent memory we can talk, MAT not applied to foreign companies. Of course, what is the nature of MAT income itself, whether it falls into the edge of profits and gains, itself is a matter of debate. But keep it aside for a moment. The clarification which has come is that foreign companies may not be liable to man and this will be affected through a large change with retrospective effect in the forthcoming budget. So a, a concession has been given to non-residents, which concession is not available to residents as far as man provisions are concerned. So treaties generally rely on the domestic law. So the Article 7 does not prescribe a method of finding the profits attributable to the the profits attributable have to be found under the domestic law and it's a universal phenomenon. It's not that India is uniquely placed or Indian treaties are uniquely placed. World over, the profits attributable to PE are computed with reference to the domestic law and the domestic law computational methods substitute and those come in the method of advancing the purpose of the uh, Article 7. So you have got Article 7.3 source country to allow deductions for expenses incurred for the purpose of PV whenever the expenses are incurred. So expenses have to be allowed and same method of accounting should be followed from year to year. These are the requirements of the PV. So I will use the India-US treaty for certain reference and discussion because most treaties, I find the most exhaustive treaty for P attribution will be the India US. All others will be either equal or a subset of this. So once we understand India US, possibly we understood the other treaties also in the same scope. Article 7, paragraph 1. If you see, the first one is what we have always been talking so far. The profits of an enterprise shall be taxable only in that state unless the enterprise carries on business in the other contracting state through a permanent establishment. So the first paragraph defines the threshold. If you are not meeting the threshold, the profits will not be taxed. It will be taxed only in the country of resident. It will not be taxed in the country of source because there is no PE. Unless there is a PE, profit shall not be taxed in the other country contracting state. This is a very simple proposition. We have talked about it earlier. It is reiterated through a treaty language. The next question is what the attribution is all about. If the enterprise carries on a business as a said, the profits of the entity may be taxed the other state, but only so much, only so much as is attributable to there are three legs in the India US treaty to the permanent establishment. Two, 
the sale of goods or merchandise of the same or similar kind as sold through the permanent textile establishment. Third one, other business activities which are similar. So, the last two we will keep aside for a second. The first one says only so much of profits which are attributable to the permanent establishment shall be levelled to tax. So, there is a cap. The entire, just because a person is a non resident enterprise is carrying on business in another country, the entire profits cannot be taxed of the non resident. Only so much of the profits which are attributable to the activity of the non uh, permanent establishment would be liable to tax is the principle. So, there is a cap. That cap is a legal cap. The computation mechanism is one which aids to supplement the legal cap. Legal cap is that only the amount which is attributable to the PE should be liable to tax. You find two more links in the same session, uh, same article. I am a company. I am resident in India. I have a permanent establishment in the US. Sitting in India, I sell the same goods. I can export from India, I can sell it locally also. I guess. For example, we will reverse the example. It is easier to find. A US company sells, establishes a branch in India, sells, transfers the goods to the branch or a warehouse and makes issues of inventory to the uh, customers in India. So, there is a PE, there is a business which is being carried on in India and therefore the goods would be liable to tax or the profits earned from the goods would be liable to tax because that is the profits attributable. US company can be part of no. I have located a customer, I have sold 100 units to him but his annual demand is 1000 units. So, the first 100 units my PE will supply. Later on, US can directly export to the customer instead of routing the inventory through the permanent establishment. So, instead of taking the inventory through the permanent establishment, it can directly sell to the customer because the customer is already established, if needs are established, now all that is required is to ensure that the orders and supplies are made from time to time. So, it may make a supply from the US also. So, what the treaty says is that you have made some activity, the permanent establishment has got a business activity of selling of goods or merchandise. If those goods or merchandise are sold through other mechanism than the permanent establishment, the profits attributable to those goods and sale of merchandise also would be included in the profits attributable to the PE. This is the second level of activity. We talk about goods and merchandise. There could be non-goods and merchandise business activity, for example, service activity. There could be many other activities which are similar but which could be performed from the outside of India. So, the third one is the link about other activities which are not dealing with sale of goods and merchandise but other business activities. Those activities performed outside of India, if those are the activities of the PE, then the profits attributable to those activities also will be included in the profit attributable to the PE. The first one or that is called the profits attributable to the permanent establishment is a direct attribution. The next two B and C are called indirect attribution. But collectively all of them are attributions. So, it would not make a difference whether you call it one or two or three. The source country can tax all the three profits which are emanating from the three activities. So, if I say the first one is direct, the second one, the next slide possibly will take us to the legal concept. It's called force of attraction principle. That is, the PE profits attracts a little more than what the PE actually carried on as activity. So, that's called force of attraction. When you have the force of attraction, the UN model also, if you see the model that is uh, convention which I given, is identical to the India US model. So, same three provisions are contained in the UN model. So, the force of attraction principles applies for activities not carried on by the PE, but those activities are carried on by the enterprise from some other location, but they are identical or similar to the activities carried on by the PE. So, tax treaties are not worded identically. All tax treaties, if you see, all treaties may not have the force of attraction clause. Only some treaties have. Yeah. 
if some treaties have the force of attraction clause, you can look at that what will happen if the force of attraction is there, only direct attribution is possible. If the force of attraction clause is also found, indirect attribution is also possible. So we have to see which are the treaties which have got these clauses. I have got an illustration of about say about 20 treaties, USA, Australia, Canada. In fact, I can say that Australia in recent times has started looking at force of attraction for IT companies. Because what we do? We perform services from India. We also send people who perform services in Australia. So the Australia we create a permanent establishment whether there would be force of attraction because similar services if they are performed from India it would constitute a force of attraction principle can be one of the difficulties which we may of course we may find difference at some point then so these are the principles which can come so uh, you find many treaties which have got force of attraction to show suppose force of attraction is found assuming that force of attraction is found whether the entire profits would be level, for example, I took the example of the US customer selling through a warehouse in India. He sells $100 to the P and makes a 10 rupee profit, $10 profit. He sells another $100 not through the P and makes another $10 profit. Whether the entire $10 would be liable to tax or it would be some portion of it which would be liable to tax. It's a matter which still remains unclear even amongst the uh, uh, settled principles. There are certain eminently principles, the Indian judicial precedents. It says that activities, even if force of attraction has to be applied, it cannot be the entire profits, it can be only the profits which the P would have paid in the interest of that. So if the P earns say 5% or 3% profits, only 3% profits would still be attributable, not the entire 10% profits which the uh, goods and services earn from our product. For example, the special bench ITAT in DIT was preferred, read down the provisions of force of attraction clause by stating that profits indirectly attributable to the PE should be only those profits in which the PE has played some part. So again, it has effectively rendered class B and class C diluted. Thus, Class B and Class C which we saw in the earlier one which create the force of attraction rules they are very vast, they have unlimited expanse. That being the case, you find that tribunal says only for the part which the PE has paid it should be taken. If the PE has paid no part then the trick can work. For example, the US customer can sell $100 worth of goods to the barrows and sell another $100 of goods not involving the warehouse, then the first hundred dollars profits would be liable to tax in India. The next hundred dollars would not be liable to tax in India is the emanating principle from this tribunal decision. I may find that this tribunal decision may get distinguished at some point in time because PEs may not play a role at some point in time, so you do not get. But anyway, it's a special bench ruling of the ITAT, so it has a superior valuation uh, value at this point than ordinary benches would be. So we can be guided by this principle at this point in time. Article 7.2, I am keeping it on the shelf for a moment. I will go to Article 7.3. Why Article 7.3? Because there is a mechanism which the treaty itself outlays as to how to compute the profits. It says, in the determination of the profits of the permanent establishment, there shall be allowed deductions. What deductions? Expenses which are incurred for the purposes of the corporate establishment. Reasonable allocation of foreign office, head office, and the general and administrative overheads. Research and development expenses which are relatable to the P, if I can say, not all the interest which is relatable to the activity of the P. Other expenses for the purpose of the interest. The expenses need not be incurred in, by the, in India or by the PE in whichever country. It can be incurred anywhere in the globe, but as long as they are incurred for the PE, it can be clear. So it's not necessary that the expense should be found that you are not incurred in India. So PE is a loose concept. If it is not always bound by books, 
you may keep books in India which may capture the expenses of India alone. You can choose to possibly claim head office expenses, general and executive expenses which are allowed by the treaty. The AO cannot possibly deny you a deduction on the basis that they are not entered in the books because the treaty allows certain deductions to be allowed. So computation of PE income or the PE profits is actually a memorandum exercise. Though a books of accounts also may be mandated by law, you can compute the memorandum P uh, profits using your own memorandum exercise because it is carving out the profits for a segment of the enterprise. It is not the enterprise itself you are computing. So that being the case, you can always find these directions. So essentially, all expenses which are relatable to the activity of the PE are deductible. We will come with certain restrictions on interest. We will come with certain restrictions on other expenses as we go along. But at this point, the treaty gives an outlet ma ma um, methodology which essentially says that you take the income or the gross income. From the gross income, you keep on deducting certain expenses which are relatable to the P. It could be research and expense, research and development expenses, it could be interest, it could be expenses, it could be incurred within the PE or it could be incurred outside in a foreign country. All these expenses, as long as they are relatable to the PE, they are deduct deductible and thus you compute the profits attributable to the PE. This is the principle which has been laid down under Article 7.3. Article 7.3 follows a method called uh, what we normally accountants know is the sales minus expenses method. You have the sales, you have the expenses, you have the profits. So you must find out what is the sales or revenues attributable to the PE. You must find out the expenses attributable to the PE. The net result of sales minus expenses would become the profit attributable to the PE. This is fine, but is it the uh, be all and end all of computation principles? we have to possibly look whether there are, again in the last line you can look in accordance with the provisions and subject to the limitations of the taxation laws of the state. So if there are limitations on allowing expenses, those limitations shall apply even to the competition method. So is there, with this rule, cannot the treaty itself allows the domestic law to survive, it does not override the domestic law. So if you say 43B is a restriction under the domestic law, that shall apply even to the computation of profits of the PE is what is mentioned in this particular article. Why did I say that this is not be all and end all of computation? If this were to be so, if I have to make a clarification here, the India US treaty, if I were to have a PE in US, US domestic law also has called what is called the what we understand as effectively connected income. <coughs> It will compute the income in the same manner as the treaty pronounced so far. It will compute the gross sales, it will compute the expenses which are deductible under, so you will compute the profit. So the India US treaty is applied equally well in the US in the same manner as India would like to apply from the Indian perspective. So it is a clear, that's what we think. However, 7.3 is such there are restrictions. What restrictions? No deduction shall be allowed in respect of certain expenses. What are those expenses? Royalties, fees or other similar payments in return for the use of patents, know-how, uh, other rights of this enterprise. If the enterprise has certain logos, patents, intangibles and so on and so forth, so the head office cannot charge a royalty to the permanent establishment that these royalties have made it available to you and therefore I am going to charge a royalty on you which would have been possible if it had been a subsidiary. If you have a subsidiary set up, you can charge royalties to the subsidiary because that is the arm's length price which you would possibly apply for the royalty. But when you are dealing with a permanent establishment, you cannot attribute royalties in respect of intangibles that are owned by the head office. Owned or it has a right of ownership with the office. There cannot be a commission, there cannot be a brokerage, there cannot be a overriding fee. That is, the permanent establishment cannot be charged any fee or management fee for a moment. All these things are not permissible. That is, there is no transaction of self-profit. The expenses should be incurred with third parties 
it cannot be an expense generated between the parent and subsidiary or parent and the permanent establishment. It has to be an expense incurred with the real third party that is outlaid by the parent uh, head office by giving and uh, laying out certain expenses with the third party. Those are the expenses which are deductible. There cannot be set up expenses generated between head office and the branch to reduce the profits of generated by the branch. Except in banking services, no interest can be charged by the head office on the branch or the permanent establishment. So you cannot have, saying that I have given you hundred dollars of working capital from head office. This working capital would have costed me say about two percent, three percent interest. So I am going to notionally charge three percent interest to you is not permissible as per the city provisions and the seventh degree. So you cannot charge royalty. You cannot have management fees or other kind of service charges. You cannot have interest. So whatever is the transaction between head office and branch, you cannot have any profit being reduced through those transactions. They have to be eliminated with the competition of profits is the way it's proceeded. So 73 has got restrictions with regard to these directions. Normally, had it been subsidiaries, all these directions would have qualified, but in the case of PE, it would not qualify. But you find certain new concepts, for example, explanation has been added under 9.1 clause 5, which directs, uh, deals with interest payable. It says PE in India of a foreign bank, for example, Citibank has established its business as a branch in India. So Indian branch will be a PE of CD US. If Citibank in India makes an interest payment to the US, then it would be that interest would be liable, chargeable to tax in India for the US entity because it's the interest payment. And that interest is can be deducted only if tax has been deducted as source. Otherwise, it cannot be deducted as source. So this is the concept which evolves for the day's provision. So there are if the way it has been positioned is that should a business the PE be treated as a separate business entity. That is, should the the rest of the, if the enterprise is, say, in the US, it has got a PE in India, should you keep the PE in India as a separate business enterprise so that the two can transact? No, it's not separate. Because if it's the under the separate business enterprise concept, which was earlier being advocated even by OECD, if the Enterprise incurs a loss from the business activity carried on by the P. That is, if that's if I let me give an example. If goods are sold in India, from the sale of goods of similar kind, the enterprise incurs a loss from the business activity globally. There was a presumption that no profit need to be attributed as far as the India is concerned, because the goods as say has per se has incurred a loss in totality. Therefore, no profit need to be attributed. This was a proposition which was there, even proposed by OEC at some point in time. This was not accepted by the member countries also. So even the member countries did not find this attribution principle very workable because the loss need not be generated out of the activity of the PE. It could be for reasons beyond the PE, if I can say. So those losses need not reduce the profits of the PE and therefore it was not acceptable, acceptable even to the member country. So when you say separate business activity approach did not gel well because it was looking at whether the end result of similar functions performed by the entity enterprise is a profit or loss. If there is a profit some attribution would be triggered. If there is no profit there won't be any attribution. This principle does not survive but for record that how the history has evolved with the attribution principles. I thought I will take it through so that we can go to the next level to understand how attribution state. So I mentioned earlier article 7 does not lay out the rules. It broadly says profit attributable. It talks about how certain deduction shall be allowed. It does not say how income will be captured. It only says how deduction will be allowed and it also says what expenses shall not be allowed as deduction. It does not capture as to what income will be captured. So you have certain uncertainty in the sense it's unclear. The treaty does not lay out 
the method of computation. Once the TT has not prescribed the exactness of how to compute the profits attributable, you have some amount of no common interpretation across treaties or countries. So different countries may use the same set of facts to arrive at different amount of profits. So if two countries, if India says profits attributable to the PE is 20, US may dispute that profits attributable to the PE is 20, it may say only 10 is attributable. If there is a dispute between two countries, because why would the US contest it? Because US has to give a foreign tax credit for the tax paid in India. So it would only give so much of credit, which is as per the treaty. If the income is not determined as per treaty, we could not give any credit. So as far as the US is concerned, it will determine the profits attributable as per its domestic law. India will determine the profit attributable as per the Indian domestic law. That can be vagaries between the two domestic law. That can be contentious issues as to how profit should be arrived There are many international court decisions which confirm that the treaties override the domestic law, even in India it is so, 92 gives the supremacy of treaty over the uh, domestic law. The purpose is that how treaties override in a, when the expression used is only profits attributable to the PE and nothing more is used, what is the overriding effect I can give to that? Nothing can be given. So actually treaties even though they are setting out the principles, they are not bringing any overriding principles into that. So even the courts felt that the OECD commentaries are not giving any guidance as to how to compute the profits, in what manner it should be computed the profits. So even the courts found difficulty, even not, not Indian courts alone, even international courts found difficulty to find out what is the method of computing the profits. Can there be some uniformity so that the two countries don't compute it in two different opposite ways? So this was a concern and this concern continued for many years. Divergent approaches were used. We saw the separate business uh, losses also. If there is a loss at the enterprise level, it gets included at the PE level. It was a single entity approach. Separate functional approach was used. We will talk about functional approach. Different capital allocations. So you don't know how much of capital should be allocated to each one, how much of assets should be allocated. For example, I have uh, uh, certain assets uh, which are all, if I have one server, I am just taking a very simple example. The server is used by the PE as well as by the enterprise as a whole. Whether depreciation or part of the server's cost should be allocated to the PE who can become a contentious issue. So you can have many more examples. The server is a very small asset in the context of the cost. You can have an entire plant for a moment being used by the PE as well as by uh, uh, the third country. So you can have multiple situations. So how much of capital should be allocated to the PE? Those are the issues which have come in the past. So the thinking of the OECD is that can we have a different approach or can we look at it differently? Is sales minus in the expenses the only method or there are other methods which will be equally giving the same result? So they look at is there a different method of attributing profits PE? So they look at what's called action remuneration principle. That is, if there is an action by the PE, the PE should be remunerated. If there is no action by the PE, then the PE need not be remunerated. We saw the earlier tribunal decision of special bench. Without possibly using this terminology of action remuneration, it also endorsed the same concept that if the PE has played a part in earning the profits, then the part of the profit shall be attributable to the PE. The PE has not played a part, it should not be entitled to any profits, or no profits will be liable to the tax. PE to be remunerated for its actions, not for any external reasons. So it all led into whether examining whether P could be treated as a functionally separate entity. No doubt a permanent establishment is legally part of the enterprise. It is not separated out legally. So when I prepare the balance sheet of the enterprise, I would include the activities of the P also. It's not that the P will go away. But for the limited purpose of taxation, a concept called functionally separate entity came. In common parlance, 
It's called separate entity approach. That is, the P is treated as if it's a separate company. The head office and the P interact with each other or transact with each other as if there are two enterprises, but they are related enterprises. So, I will take you, I part Article 7.2 earlier, only because Article 7.3 read with the first principle of attribution. Article 7.2 is a strictly, strictly a different article. It essentially says, so much of profit attributed to that permanent establishment, the profits which it might be expected to make, if it were a distinct and independent enterprise, engaged in the same or similar activities, under the same or similar conditions, and dealing wholly at arm's length with the enterprise of which is a permanent establishment. So, it brings what is called a hypothetical situation. It keeps the permanent establishment as if it's a separate enterprise. Now, the profit is a notional profit. It is no more a computed profit. It is supposed to earn the same amount of profits as similar enterprises placed in similar conditions would earn as quo, it is treated as a notional profit. So, if it is a notional profit has to be computed, income becomes irrelevant, the computational mechanism also becomes irrelevant and how you arrive at the expenses also become relevant because no matter what my expenses are, if my end result is that I have earned through the computational mechanism a lower profit than what similar enterprises would earn, then my profit will be restated into the arm's length principle that for all the profit which I would be expected to earn as if I am a separate enterprise. So this concept was found always in most treaties, but it was not applied very frequently. So this is called the separate enterprise price. So the P is treated as if it's a subsidiary and it's being the transactions would be so you have to pay so much of earn so much of profits as an independent enterprise would earn. So this brings a little amount of deeming fiction. It's indeed a deeming, as if it might. Might is a deeming. So you can find that this particular article 7.2 is found in most treaties. It's found in all treaties, if I may say. So how do you reconcile article 7.3 and article 7.2? Article 7.2 and 7.3 would be reconciled in a particular way that ordinarily you may find that both profits are similar. That is, the expenses which are relatable to the PE and the income which are relatable to the PE would be so determined that it meets the, meets the arm's length principle. If expenses are at arm's length and the income is also earned at arm's length, then nothing is left. It will In totality, you will meet the enterprise concept as it would. So you have to reconcile 7.2 and 7.3. It's not that 7.2 is at a contradiction to 7.3 or 7.3 is contradicting 7.2. Both have to be applied in a manner that the end result is the same. If I have to use the transfer pricing method, there are people who say there are five methods or six methods. No matter what method you apply, the end result should be arm's length price. So here also, no matter how you apply the income and the expenditure, the end result should be the same amount of profits which the PE would earn had it been a separate enterprise in similar conditions and so on and so forth. So this is the principle which is there. Then it says, in case there is a difficulty to compute the profits, then it can be computed to a reasonable basis. That is, I will, I got a couple of Supreme Court decisions, reasonable means what appears to be reasonable to a prudent person. So if no method is available, you don't have the income minus expenses method, you are not able to have arm's length principle method, then a reasonable method would be applied and the profits would be computed. What is reasonable? We will look at a couple of Supreme Court decisions and where it has been held to be reasonable. Those are indicative that the judicial precedents look at reasonability in a particular way and we cannot possibly look at it differently because there are precedents from the Supreme Court to the assignment. You can see the last line which is what I also said earlier. The estimate adopted shall however be such 
that the result shall be in accordance with, with the principles contained in this article. So no matter what you do, finally it is the profits attributable and it should be equal to the enterprise ability to earn profits under similar conditions. So OECD, what it did, it said that why reinvent many things? We have positioned the PE as equal to a separate enterprise. If it is a separate, separate enterprise, I don't have to find new sets of rules to find arms like profit. We will apply the TP principles. So the TP principles, arms length principles and transfer pricing guidelines, whatever is applicable between a parent and subsidiary, can also be applied between a head office of the enterprise and the PE so that it will apply parity material. It will say whatever is applicable to subsidiary would also apply to the PE. This is the principle which was evolved by the OECD. And OECD essentially aligned attribution principles to the OECD transfer pricing principles. Both are aligned. So whatever is the transfer pricing you would apply, you will also apply to the PE. Whether I am required to apply it necessarily, treaty does not say, the domestic law does not say, but this is the method which is available under the treaty and the assessing officer can always invoke this method and say that I all that I have done is to put you equal to a subsidiary except for certain restrictions that is subsidiary may be in a position to deduct certain expenses which a PE cannot deduct because those are restrictions paid by article 73. What are the expenses? Number one royalty between the parent and subsidiary, management expenses, fees charged management fee or may fee charge and interest. These are not deductible except the interest is deductible only for banking companies otherwise they are not deductible. So you find these restrictions are in place. So while these are deductible for a subsidiary, they are not deductible for a branch or PE. So that's the distinction we will have. You found the member states of OECD were overwhelmingly with the recommendations most countries or even all countries like the TP principle. In fact, the world over, they started emphasizing on the arms length principle or the TP guidelines to be applied in relation to the determination of profits of attributable to a PE. So, while applying TP principles or TP principles, what are the things? You determine the actions. We earlier talked about action remuneration. So what are the actions of the PE? It will be functions, risks, assets which are employed. Those are the actions of the PE. And remuneration would be ALP, comparable assets, benchmarking and so on. So those will be, so the remuneration will be had, determined having regard to ALP, comparable analysis, benchmarking, those which you do for ordinary uh, transfer pricing activity you may be required, though it's not mandated by law, because if you see international transaction definition, the PE of a foreign country in India is an international transaction. But if the Indian company has a PE in a foreign country, then there is no international transaction. So if I have a permanent establishment in United States, I am an Indian company, I have a permanent establishment in United States, then India will not mandate transfer pricing principle because India anyway takes the total fee of income into India, worldwide income will be taxed in India, so it doesn't make a difference as far as India is concerned. But US will apply the transfer pricing principles to the PE. So you have a situation that actions of the PE would constitute functions, risks and assets, what we normally understand in transfer pricing as FAR, and those actions functions, results, uh, risks and assets will translate into comparative analysis, benchmarking and finally determination of ELP. So while we are dealt with, when we are dealing with two real legal entities, the parent and the subsidiary, you know who is the owner, whether the asset is owned by the parent or is owned by the subsidiary because ownership can be easily traced and is a factual determination. But when you are dealing with PE and a parent or a head office, the ownership is owned by the, the ownership is a legal concept. The ownership is always with the entity. It does not rest with the permanent establishment. So artificially we have to find out how the ownership will be determined vis-a-vis -vis PE. Because who owns the assets is the legal entity. 
And the legal entity encompasses everything. It encompasses the PE, it encompasses the head office, and it encompasses the rest of the organization, if I may say. But the ownership of assets is with the legal entity. Whether the ownership can rest with the PE would depend upon certain facts. How it is determined, we look at it. And head office may normally, when the subsidiary declares dividend, you will find that it is liable to tax as income in the hands of the free apparent, that will be special retirement at all. When P declares a dividend or the profits are distributed, again that could be some tax consequences between the P and the profit. In India there is no tax consequence because we do not have a branch profit tax in India, which concept was actually envisaged in the direct tax code, but it does not come about. But foreign companies are taxed free to at 40 or percent while domestic companies are taxed at 30 or percent. So you have a rate differential, but you have a branch company. So having regard to that, the head office may use cash daily by the PE. It's nice to break uh, for 10 minutes, so I also thought that uh, I come to the next level of discussion. So, the separate enterprise approach or functionally separate entity, the, which is what the OECD has left as a suggestion or a recommendation to be adopted in interpreting the treaty, is that profits to be attributed even if the enterprise as a whole makes a loss. That is, the P may have a profit, while the enterprise as a whole may have a loss. So this is the emergence. This is the separating point, the earlier separate business entity approach. Possibly recommended that if the entity as a whole incurs a loss, then the P itself will not have a profit. But if you have a separate, functionally separate entity approach, then you have a situation that the enterprise as a whole may incur a loss, but still, P may there are a profit. <coughs> so, how do I find out the profit? And the, it has got two steps. How do I find the profit? Two steps is what is followed. Step one, it has got functional and factual analysis. Then, attribution of assets, which normally you don't do in transfer pricing exercise involving two enterprises because. When an asset is owned by a legal enterprise, when it is owned by an enterprise as a whole, how do you attribute assets to the branch or the PE? That requires a separate exercise which may not be required in a transaction between two related parties or associated enterprises. Attribution of risks, attribution of free capital because the capital is now can flow between the PE and the enterprise and the enterprise and the PE in a free way, you may have to find out what is the attribution of free capital and recognition of dealings, not dealings with either. So what are the dealings which will be there? So we have to find all the transactions. So you have five metrics to be met to find the attribution of profits. One, functional and factual analysis, that is how the PE functions vis-a-vis -vis the enterprise. So that is what you will do in the first step. Number two is attribution of assets. Number three will be attribution of, I got some details in the next slide to deal with some of them. Attribution of free capital and recognition of dealings. Dealings is nothing but transactions. If you have transactions, how do you recognize those transactions? Once you have got all these ascertained and you have got in place, the next step is to hypothesize the profit. That is, it may not be the real profit, it is not the computational profit which you desire. It is the profits of the hypothesized separate and independent enterprise based on comparability assets. So you have got all these five factors determined. If these are the given five factors, what would be similar enterprise under same conditions would earn? That is the hypothesized process, profits which will determine and that is called the separate enterprise approach. So functional and factual analysis, it would involve identification of transactions, 
with other unrelated and P itself may carry on many transactions with unrelated parties. It's not necessary the P should transact only with the enterprise or the rest of the enterprise. P may have its own transactions with unrelated parties. So those transactions will have to be discovered, found and done. Second one, transactions with related enterprises, that is other related enterprises, not the one of which it's a PE. So it will have transactions with unrelated parties. It will have transactions with related parties of the enterprise to which it belongs or it is a PE. Third, when there is dealings with other parts of the enterprise. So you will have three sets of transactions, unrelated party transactions, transactions with related enterprises of which it is a PE. Third one, transactions of the PE and the rest of the enterprise itself. So three sets of transactions will belong to the PE and they are all to be aggregated and functionally as factually determined. The next one is attributing the assets. When you say assets, normally assets ownership is only legal. I can say I own this watch. It is very difficult to say that me, my P owns this watch because the ownership always rests with the legal person. Ownership is a legal concept, but for the limited purposes of ownership of P, you evolve what is called an economic ownership. It possibly you find out amongst the enterprise and the P who is the higher economic owner of the asset, which is using the asset more compared to the operations of the company. So the economic ownership is what we are dealing with, not the legal ownership. Legal ownership is always with the enterprise. We have to arrive at the economic ownership in this card. Attributing this, then this attribution would happen in any other case. You have to find out how much of risks have been borne by the permanent establishment vis-a-vis -vis the enterprise itself. In the absence of contractual arrangement, this contribution will be driven by facts. If there are contractual arrangements, you can determine through the contracts. If there are no contractual arrangements, then you have to determine having regard to the facts, how the P interacts with the rest of the enterprise. Those are the risk parameters you have to ask. Attribution of free capital, because you do not know how much of capital by use, by whom. So that also, for example, if the profits, P keeps on generating profits. What can happen with the profits? He can either retain the profits or it can make a distribution of those profits to the enterprise or overseas enterprise. If it retains the capital or retains the profits, it will keep on accumulating cash in its balance sheet. If it distributes, then the capital will go to the parent company. The distribution has a different impact than maybe branch profits tax in certain countries. But retention also has a different impact because it will amount to assets of the permanent establishment and it may be expected to earn a return on capital having regard to the capital generated by the PE. So you have these kind of principles and recognition of the deals. So these are the ways you have to find out the functionality test. Once you have find step 2 is determining the profits of hypothesized enterprise based on comparability analysis. Same conditions, similar, so you will do exactly matching and you will do discount of third parties to arrive at some kind of matching principles. There will be adjustments made and you will arrive at the profit. It is exactly equal to Tom's length. So what is the difference between a transfer pricing study between two related enterprises or associated enterprises and a functional analysis of a PE is that in the this category, you may find attribution of assets quite difficult because you are trying to shift the legal ownership into economic ownership, which may be a slightly a difficult task with a VOP. The other difficulty is to find free capital. You do not know how much of free capital is the free capital attributable to the P and how much of free capital is attributable to the rest of the organization. These two difficulties are new these are we transfer pricing principles. Other factors are similar to a transfer pricing exercise as we normally do between two related or associated enterprises in international transaction. Some important considerations, they I call it key issues, 
but more than issues, they are important considerations as well. People functions, branch versus sub, whether the result should be spent as a separate enterprise, uh, should the uh, permanent establishment be treated here like a branch, or it is different still, we have to understand. How tangibles will be dealt with, how intangibles will be dealt with, what will be the capital attribution, uh, there are a few other things which I will talk about, symmetrical approach, risk transfers, dependent agents, PEs and so on. I got a little more to explain on each one of them. I will try and see if we can discuss these aspects of the program. See, unlike two separate enterprises where you have got the transfer pricing principles applied, people functions are hard to determine in a permanent reception. What would be the cost of a managing director sitting in a head office? Whether he is making all the decisions or P is making all the decisions. Whether the head office is making decisions or is the P which is making decisions. So you will now even between enterprises it's not very easy to determine where decisions are made. But when it comes to P and the rest of the enterprise, people actions are hard to define. But they actually determine the amount of profits which are attributable. If people active decision making rest with the PE, more profits may have to be attributed to the PE. For example, you have got marketing PE, correct? We have heard of sales PE, agency PE, marketing PE and so on and so forth. A marketing PE may be have to be attributed more profits than a execution PE because marketing involves some entrepreneurial activity. It takes a little more risk it requires a little more decision making, therefore a marketing PE will have higher attributes of profits than an execution PE which does not take as much risk, which does not decide many things because the execution metrics are already defined. So you will have this kind of a decision. So what is the amount of extent of active decision making which the PE is engaged? That will determine the amount of profits. Where ongoing risk management happens, so if you have got the business going on, the business, if it is managed by the PE itself, it needs a higher profit share. If the risks are managed by the enterprise outside of the PE, then it will get a lower share. So you have to find out where the risk taking activities are taking place. So you find something called key entrepreneurial risk taking functions, curd in uh, uh, just for shortness. So it works on the principle that risk follows functions. Functions, capital follows risk, but when it comes to people functions, you have a difficulty because what is normally true with other assets, like any tangible or intangible asset, risk will follow functions and capital will follow risk. That should not be true because if you want more risk, you will employ more capital. If you enjoy less risk, you will enjoy uh, uh, deploy less capital. Capital could be financial capital, it could be asset capital, or it could be intellectual capital, or it could be IPRs and so on and so forth. But if you want more risk, you will have usually employ more risk, more capital. If you want, uh, if you have more functions, you will take more risk. And therefore, these are all risk follow functions, and capital follows risk. With these two principles, you can determine the attribution principle for all other assets other than people functions. People functions, inability, we cannot separate the capital and the risk because decisions are very, very fluid. You don't know to where the decisions are made. So with people functions, we need a higher documentation as to where people are perform, performing and which activity they are performing. So, for example, I will skip the first part and come to the second. <coughs> server P, a server P is nothing but an asset. It doesn't have any P. Can we say that the server profitability should be equal to the functions performed by the server? Maybe it's performing a lot more, but essentially the limited functionality of a sub, uh, per, uh, server is absence of personal. If personal is absent, then only equipment is left and the performance of the equipment, the attribution has to be low. It's the way the concept had developed in the past, whether it will remain so, we have to possibly see in the future, but essentially if people function is the most important criteria for attribution and in the server situation there is no personal involved, 
Therefore, what is left is only equipment. If only equipment is required, then the profits will be low, is the way it was estimated earlier. We have to see how the digital commerce field evolves over a period of time. This law holds good at this point in time. Maybe we have to revise our thinking as commentaries come on digital economy. Branch was a subsidiary. Branch is nothing but P. One of the P is uh, description is a branch. If you look at the definition of uh, P in uh, Article 5, you will find that branch is also listed. For convenience, I have mentioned it as branch. It sticks to our mind better. So a branch was a subsidiary. Are they equal? In concept, they are equal for the limited purposes of functionally separate entity approach which is adopted. But outcomes need not be different. For the profit which is attributable to your subsidiary may be less than a profit which may be attributed to a branch. For the reason that subsidiary can take certain expenses which are not capable of being deducted in arriving at the bank. For example, you can have royalty charge, you can have interest charge, you can have management expenses. These can all be charged to your subsidiary but you cannot charge it to your P. Therefore, the outcomes of profit vis-a-vis -vis a branch need not be the same as it would be vis-a-vis -a, -vis a subsidiary. So, outcomes may be different, so functionally both are treated equally. Lack of segregation of capital risk means no reward for provision of capital because so if the head office makes available capital to the PE, then interest is not deductible. If head office makes available certain assets, then there is no charge possible for those because royalty is not allowed. So you find these limitations coming vis-a-vis -vis PE which are not formed when you are dealing with separated enterprise or subsidies. So, can ownership be shifted? <coughs> what is, I talk about ownership being legal ownership, but in practice, you can find economic ownership. You may find that the PE is using certain assets. For example, I deploy my people abroad to perform on-site activities. If I give each one of them a laptop to carry, and they use the laptop to discharge the functions of on-site execution of software, then the asset is clearly owned by the legal entity here, but the economic ownership at that relevant point rests with the PE and therefore the use of the asset would belong to the PE. So you can use make a usage test to find out where the assets belong. Similarly, in royalties, certain uh, if there are certain royalties, you can find out if expenses are incurred for developing IPR. While cross charge of royalty is not possible, if the IPR is owned by the enterprise and it wants to charge a royalty on the PE, that royalty will not be deductible. But if the IPR is jointly developed by the PE and the head office and the economic outcome has to be shared between the PE and the head office, the sharing of that economic activity or the royalty, in that case the charge arising out of that economic activity can be deducted out of fee. So, if royalty is charged because the IPR is owned by the head office, it will not be deductible. But if IPR is jointly developed or developed by the PE only, then amortization of that royalty or the expenses associated with the royal, uh, uh, that IPR, those things would become deductible in computing the profits of the public distribution. Slightly a different concept, difficult concept. If I thought, if I have not made myself clear, I will try and explain. I will just use the enterprise as head office for limited understanding. Head office is outside India. Permanent establishment is in India. Head office owns the IPR. It wants to charge a royalty for the use of the IPR by the PE. That royalty will not be deductible. But if the IPR is jointly developed by the efforts of the PE and the resources of the PE along with the efforts and resources of the head office then it's an economic ownership of the IPR and therefore if there's a deduction which is arising out of those IPRs it could be the matter of depreciation or it could be any other expenditure that particular charge will be deducted in computing the profits of the PE. That could be also 
also a different way of dealing with this. For example, while royalty itself is not deductible, that could be branded goods. For example, tomorrow Vanazan, which is there in India, which is owned by an Indian company. If Vanazan is a, uh, a sold world well over, then the price of goods would always include a value of the IPR. It's a branded goods. The price would always include some amount of IPR value, otherwise the shirt will not sell at the same price at which it is selling. So once the price of goods is including the amount of IPR, the profits of the brands or the PE also will determine having regard to certain deductions because if the price includes certain royalty, then the deduction also has to be allowed for those because otherwise, so in transactions of profit, the buying and selling of goods, certain amount of royalties may get embedded into it. That is permissible. So direct charge of royalty is not permissible. Royalty charged through a price mechanism is permissible. So that is the distinction. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, any misconception, anybody has not understood, I can make it more clear. So I don't see a hand raising, so I will change. So use test is what is done. Whoever is using the asset at the relevant point would be entitled to the directions arising out of the use of the asset. So if assets are required, the repairs will be allowed in the hands of the PE. If assets are economically owned by the PE, depreciation will be allowed to the PE. What happens if the assets are jointly used by the PE and the head office of the enterprise? That's a depreciation claim. Your depreciation as you compute under the Income Tax Act may be different from the depreciation as the head office would compute in its uh, own uh, country. So actually you are allowed to claim depreciation even pro rata. Just as you have got a joint ownership of asset, for the portion which you feel the PE owns, you can claim a depreciation for that portion and have a deductible amount set up in your return of income of the PE. So it will be eligible. So you can apportion or else you can presume that the entire IPR is owned by the head office but compute the depreciation under the Indian law and allocate a part of the depreciation while computing the income for the first. So like expenditure is allocated in certain way, you allocate the depreciation also in certain way and compute the amount of profits. These are not concepts which are regularly evolved and followed, but because I handled about 30, 40 countries P and the returns there, I can say these are practices which are followed very easy, uh, ritual. Uh, in fact, the moment I have an asset which is common, immediately, for example, I have a development center in India. If the development center is a building, it has to be necessarily in India, but the development center contributes to the earning of profits of the PE outside, say, UK or USA, I am entitled to claim the depreciation on the building to compute the profits of my UK PE or the US PE. In my view, it is we are entitled and you can claim it, but not the whole of the depreciation, but only that part of the depreciation which goes into the contribution of profits in the UK. So you will apportion the depreciation also the same way you apportion the expenses. So these concepts we can keep evolving. Many would not have done in Indian conditions, but they are all globally accepted phenomena. We can try and do it. If there are usage charges which may be allowed in sir. For example, it's not royalty. Usage charge is that the same asset is used both by the head office and the PE. Then certain, instead of allowing a depreciation, they may substitute it with a usage charge and allow a usage charge as a deduction in computing because the PE profit is not a regular computational profit. It's a hypothetical profit. When you do a hypothetical profit, it's an economic result which you want. In doing an economic result, if there are certain charges which cannot be correctly estimated, it can be substituted with estimates. So usage charge is a substitute for depreciation and you can claim a usage charge as a deduction to the extent the usage is attributable to the earning of profits by the P. So step one, when having got all the five functions, you determine significant people functions. Analysis continues for attribution of risks, economic ownership. 
and free capital of the bee. So I said the two new things which have come which are a B and an associated enterprise is the last two. Economic ownership of assets and free capital of the PE. So having done that, now your determination made that where significant revenue earning activities take place. So you have got the cost, you have got the revenues and therefore you are able to arm's length profit which can be earned. So essentially this slide, a function of step 1 and step 2, though it gives rise to 7-2 profit, article 7-2 profit that is as if it is a separate enterprise, this in reality should match with 7-3 profit also because having that the two steps of revenue generation equal to the functions performed by the PE, expenses equal to what the uh, functions, all the functions performed by the PE, the profit is automatically an arm's length profit which will be comparable with 7-2 profits which you are arriving at as an hypothetical concept. So 7-2 and 7-3 are not in conflict but they should yield the same result. They may not be tested year after year but conceptually they should yield the same result. So all the changes which OECD made from time to time, these are all changes which have come from 2010. They tend to increase the profits in the source country where the P is there. If not the profits tax, it may increase the profits at least because all countries may not tax the profits immediately but it will certainly generate more profits in certain countries. The proposed changes could be considered as less business friendly because you are going to be taxed more for the PE and these proposals have not so far eliminated double taxation. The yeah, purpose of double taxation avoidance agreement is to ensure that there is no double taxation or there is a relief of double taxation. Certain times these competition methodologies may not result in relieving double taxation wholly. But considering that the methodology is accepted even in domestic law, you may find that the profit is taxed on arms length principle. A foreign tax credit also may be allowed in India or the foreign country if the P is in the foreign country and you may find neutrality essentially. So the acceptability of arms length principle is what is required in the local administration which you find is happening over a period of time. So I did talk about the interest and royalties not being deductible. Uh, so you have that clarified here. Article 7 has got few more principles. I will highlight those principles and it is very obvious but we will read it together. Where the profits include items of income which are dealt with separately in other articles of the convention then the provisions of those articles shall be applicable. So let me deal with a few. Can there be royalty if the, there is a royalty and that can be fees for technical services, that can be interest income. If these are the kinds of income which have to be dealt with under those articles, then those articles will supersede this article of Article 7 and you will apply those articles. Likewise, if you see all the other articles also, they will also say if the income is attributable to the PE, then Article 7 will be applicable and not Article 12. So you will find some kind of a conflict as Article 7 says that Article 12 will apply, Article 12 says Article 7 applies. Essentially, it is not just a conflict. You have to find whether the stream of income is inextricably atta attached to the activities of the PE. If the activities of the PE and the income streams are relatable, then it will be business profits. So fees for technical services also will be business profits and tax like business profits if Article 7 were to be applied, but if it is fees for technical services without being attributable to the PE, because there is no nexus with the PE or the activities of the PE are not going to cover those income, then it will be Article 12 which will be applicable. What is the difference between Article 7 and Article 12? Article 7 works on the principle of net profit being taxed. Article 12 works on the principle of gross income being taxed. So the outcomes in the two articles could be substantially different. <coughs> so
So what did you do? Uh, if I have a P, I have arm's length principle. I computed the profit using the arm's length principle, saw this function analysis, study, economic ownership, all those things I have done. I have arrived at the correct amount of profit. Is that the finality? Or is this something more to be found? Now we come to the principle of agency principle. A dependent agent is one of the PE classifications you will find in Article 5. I think that is a common understanding we have that a dependent agent constitutes a PE. Once a dependent agent constitutes a PE, it has got who can be a dependent agent, even a subsidiary can be a dependent agent. There's no difficulty. For example, if the subsidiary has got a power to conclude contracts on behalf of the holding company, then the subsidiary also can be a dependent PE for the holding company. So having regard to that, we have two difficulties. In a dependent PE classification, actually there are two streams of income. One is the agency income, the other is the PE income. A dependent agent is a PE, Agency is the activity, PE is also an activity, that is PE is also created. The question is, I determine the profits attributable to the agency, I apply the arm's length principle, now have I computed the profits of the PE also because I have applied the arm's length principle or is there a separate profit to be computed in addition to the profits of the dependent agency. Slightly a little advanced concept, I will repeat just for uh, or uh, make it a different construct of explanation. I am a company incorporated in the US. I have a subsidiary which is a sales and marketing subsidiary in India. I am a manufacturer of aircraft engine, for example, Rolls Royce. This is a station which is covered, we can speak about it a little later. I am Rolls Royce, presuming that I am headquartered in US for convenience, it will not be headquartered in the Europe headquartered. Rolls Royce manufactures engines, it appoints the Indian subsidiary to make sales of engines, aircraft engines in India, and therefore a agency PE is created by the subsidiary in India. So the subsidiary is compensated for all the activities on arms length principle. So the agency P is paid an arm's length price, so whatever the compensation the parent has to pay to the subsidiary as an agent that is fully compensated and the arm's length principle is fully satisfied. The question is, this agent has also become a P of the US company, correct? If it is a P of the US company, having earned an arm's length income, whether anything more is attributable or nothing more is attributable because you have already earned arm's length profit nothing more is required to earn arm's length profit but still there is a P which has been created because of the activity whether more profits than arm's length profit could be required to be attributed to the P is the issue which we have discussed. This is a slightly most complex aspect of the discussion today so if yes, anybody has not understood the concept I will repeat again I request you to raise your hand so that you can make it simple. The profits beyond the arm's length for the creation of the PE, whether any more attribution is required, is the issue we are dealing with. So, what you said, uh, the PE and agent is the same entity. Same entity. Of the, of the same entity in US. Of the, of the US entity. So, it can be. Uh, a P can be classified as an agent only in case it retains some profit and sends, uh, and uh, remits the re remaining part of the profit to the agent. It performs two roles. Okay. If, have you seen a movie with double acting? Yeah. The actor is the same, but the moment he puts a beard is a different person. Correct? Here also, one is without the beard, the other is with beard. The one without beard is the agency for which you have paid the compensation. But this is an actor, he says, I have performed two roles. You have taken the entire film based on my two roles rather than one single role. So a hero would have charged say, one crore for a single role. For two roles, he may not get two crores. But he must get something more than one crore. That's the question. Okay. I am not late. Don't bother about remittance. Remittance is the next act. How can 
can a same uh, see yeah, it will sell the same role for as being a pe or being an agent ha huh. so, yeah, being an agent it sells yes. being a pe is another attribute which has come yeah. as a agent if there is no pe you will earn 100 dollars if there is a pe also you will earn only 100 or you will earn more than 100 that's the question so i gave nice example of an actor pursuing two roles because that will stick to the mind faster than this person but it confused me it didn't i will clarify you are a hero of my film <laughs> Take that example of also. I think you are right. You are a hero of my film. I am willing to pay you one crore for a single act. Then I, you, I tell you that guy actually is a double act. Are you willing to settle with one crore? You will say, see, you are going to make money because I am playing two roles here. You have financed my composition. That's all the principle here. The P plays one role and the agency plays one role. Agency is fully compensated is the one crore. The double role, the same person plays, even though is going to occupy the same screen space as you would have done possibly with a single role, because he brings a differentiation in the characters. That's a different profession. So take that as a simple example and work out. So these are things evolving. So there are certain resolutions. So what you said is what Supreme Court said. saying that are baba one bob one profit is over one arm slip is over what is left nothing else is left we'll come to that supreme court said what you said but international community does not agree okay once an agency is there functional alliance is done and so on and so forth we i'm not dealing with arm slip profit arm slip profit is granted we are not disputing that under the oecd approach the p profits may exceed an arm's length profit attributable to the agent that is there something more to be found for the p beyond the arm's length profit this is the oecd approach this was slightly perplexed for many people including the supreme court so we come to certain decision which supports our good friends point here because he was unconvinced that there can be an extra profit beyond arm profit now i am coming to your decision which will support the point which you want to argue i will also let them oppose your point with another decision <clears throat> the bombay high court in set satellite singapore held that while the assc has a different dependent agents p dap in india it was admitted by the revenue that the assc had paid arms length remuneration to the dependent agent the ruling held the assc cannot be assessed in respect of profits attributable to the said dap that is nothing more is left once the agency p is compensated with arms length price nothing more is left to be taxed in the hands as a p everything is exhausted in taxing the arms length profit was the principle which was evolved in the bombay high court decision in set satellite which followed the supreme court decision in morgan stanley 292 itr 416 which again said if the correct arms length price is applied and paid nothing further would be left to be taxed in the hands of the foreign enterprise so you don't have to find a separate profit or an additional profit for the pe whatever is the profit you are determined for the agency principle agency for on an arms length principle that would be the only profit is the principle which morgan stanley avoided but morgan stanley was not possibly asked this straight question it was a contextual interpretation it was involving some kind of a, a deputation of people it only said in this context this is okay because a more a contextual question raised before an authority can evolve uh, uh, some kind of a different decisions compared to the, uh, the decision which has been given in model cell so there is no difference between the computation of profits of a dependent agent and any other p a dependent agent is also a p it also has the same principles you will do functional analysis 
and you will give the amount of rewards for the services provided to the non-resident enterprise. You will find out the profits attributable to the assets and risks involved. All those things, whatever you do for a regular PE, you will do for a dependent agency also and find the arm's length profits for the dependents. There is no difficulty with that. So, Article 7, I already referred to the earlier side that purchase would not attract any attribution. Then, Article 7, the pro, uh, uh, it also uh, has subclass. Assets shall include only the profits derived from the assets and activities of the permit. So, it's again that principle of attribution is a little more explained in Article 7 further down that it shall relate only to the assets and the activities of the uh, permanent establishment and nothing more. So, there is a cap which is being brought using all these principles and the same method shall be used year after year. Some friends during the tea break asked me how I allocate, allocation is a tough problem. It can always be questioned. Some allocation can result in excessive depreciation uh, uh, expenses being allot allocated. So, the profit can be dipped. Is not allocation a uh, uh, question of judgment which is capable of being questioned by the authorities. Allocation is a matter of judgment. It is not a, a precise science. It cannot be exactly measured. So what the treaty ensures is that you will follow the same methodology as long as the methodology is one of the accepted methodology. You will follow the same methodology year after year after year. Then your allocation methodology may be allocated. For example, you follow turnover as the basis of allocation of your common heads. Then year after year you keep following turnover as the basis. Then your allocation methodology may not be questioned. But if you keep changing the ratios from time to time depending on your profit attributes, then neither turnover will survive nor the new method will survive. It will go into reasonable basis rather than allocation using the principles which we have. So, all revenue authorities, including, including the Indian authorities, have been looking at the TP pro, uh, provisions have been applied even to the PEs. You have got uh, mentor graphics, uh, which is the very early decision which came, Philips software, all these decisions have evolved on the principles of arms length principle being applied for arriving at the profits attributable to permanent establishment. India is also following the separate enterprise approach, but it is not advocated or set in the same form, but they say that you will follow the usage of uh, the what is called functional and FR analysis. They will say arms length principle, transfer pricing principles, if you keep on, instead of saying that I am following a separate enterprise or method, you can always use all the methodology to arrive at the profits as a separate enterprise. For example, you can have FAR analysis, you can compute profits, it will result in the same separate enterprise approach which the OECD guidelines are given from time to time. As far as the domestic law is concerned, 911, income from business connection taxable in India to the extent it is attributable to India specific operations, that is the scope of 9.1. Rule 10 is a very old rule, reasonable profits, we talked so earlier, somewhere we said if no method is good, reasonable profits will be allowed. Rule 10 says the profit shall be split in accordance with the same as a percentage of total work or the amount varying the same proportion to the total profits in the ratio of receipts accruing or arising value to the total receipts. So, it is an allocation based on revenues is what rule 10 essentially gives. So, it is a simplistic method. So, so uh, I also mentioned during my discussion today that if you are using turnover as a method of allocation, it would be an acceptable method as long as you follow it year after year and without changing the metrics, otherwise it will not be an acceptable method. Rule 10 is an illustration that turnover is an acceptable method. But it would result in a turnover can have some kind of a adoptism because you may not find certain activities which are carried out in a foreign country may not be carried out in India. Certain activities which are carried out in India may not be carried out. So, P country and the uh, resident country 
the functions may not be same. So tone hour is an ad hoc method, but it's a reasonable method because if you are not following a method, then it is also a good method to find out the profits. I will talk about certain judicial precedents and then leave it for a question and answer. Applying an ad hoc rate of calculus will be as well. Anglo French Textile Limited. The Supreme Court in this case, 25 ITR 27, is a very old case. It essentially said that 10% profits attributed to the carry down is reasonable. So it talked about reasonable. Now, nothing, no competition at all. It was fine that these kind of activities you have carried on, it looks reasonable. That's it. Reasonable. So you find that the Supreme Court said that 10% profit in these circumstances is reasonable. Hukum Chand Mills, 103 ITR 548. It was a case involving British India and the other parts. It was an agency fee in concept. The tribunal determined 15% profits. The Supreme Court held that it was reasonable in the facts of the case. In the absence of some statutory or other fixed formula, any finding on question of proportion involves some element of guesswork. These are the wordings in the Supreme Court. I am not substituting. So it's a guesswork. Sometimes you don't have anything on your hand. You have to do a guesswork. And that guesswork is what is allowed as a reasonable profit and that's acceptable. In law, you don't have to. That's why income tax is not about precision profits. Income tax is about assessment of profits. Any profit which is accessible as the income is good profit. Nothing more. This is a reasonable profit. The Supreme Court says the endeavor can be only to approximate and that cannot be in the very nature of things be great precision and exactness in the method. These are the words used in the Supreme Court decision. So you can see the difficulty in arriving at the profits attributable to the permanent establishment. Even after you do all the functional analysis, even after you do everything, you will find that you have not arrived at the profits which is exact. It is still narrow to being exact but it is not exact. So a price of B profit attributable is always an estimate. It need not be final or real. Unlike a profit of a company which is determined within a balance sheet or a profit loss account, which is also a reported profit, which need not be the best. So you deal with a reported profit rather than profit is a matter of opinion, somebody says. So here also is a profit is a matter of opinion. So you come at a profit which is reasonable and that's all you have to do to arrive at the profits of a PE. Once you say it's reasonable, and the reasonable stands on the questions of reasonability, you are safe, certainly. Motorola, this is a company which was selling cellular equipment in India. The Indian subsidiary was rendering support activities and marketing agreements were entered into. So it was creating some kind of a dependent agency relationship vis-a-vis -vis the parent. And the special bench held that the attribution of 20% of the net profits of the sale of equipment in India is a reasonable profit. was sufficient for the role played. It was not benchmark. It was just an estimate. The tribunal said that when equipment sold in India is $100 worth. Profits earned from the India for the equipment sold is say $20. 20% of the $20 is an adequate compensation for the permanent establishment caused by a dependent agency and therefore that would be a reasonable profit to be taxed. This is Motorola's decision, a special bench decision. So again, there is nothing very called, very scientific principle. It goes on, find what is the profit earned by the enterprise? $20. Is the equipment made in India? No. Is the equipment branded in India? No. What is that is which is done in India? Some saving arrangements in India and support arrangements in India. For this, the tribunal said 20% of the profits would be adequate for the equipment sold in India. So this is the way the profits have been arrived at. Galileo is a very unique decision. There was no P. Essentially, there was no people P, there was no subsidiary. Essentially, the ticket and hotel booking activities were carried on. Some of the tickets got generated out from India. 
and therefore the Singh authority said that the activities of business is being carried on in India. If tickets are generated out of India in travel, then automatically there will be tickets generated. So for it was attributed as principal here. Again, the conclusion that 15 percent of resource uh, receipts are of booking made in India could be reasonably be attributable income accruing in India through PE on the basis of PE played in rural in adopt. There is nothing rocket science. All that you have to keep on saying is what is the role played by the PE and what is the total profits of the enterprise, whether the profits of the PE can be relatively adjusted for the role played by the PE. Nothing. There. If you see the decisions and all, you don't find many comparables saying that it is okay, not okay. Morgan Stanley we discussed. Essentially, it is a decision which essentially held that once the PE is paid an arm's length price, Nothing more survives and that's the last of the price which will be preserved. Galileo we talked about. Rolls Royce, I took an example in my illustration. This is a live example of Rolls Royce which essentially said R&D expenses are carried out not in India. <coughs> Manufacturing expenses are not carried out in India. So the profits are split into three activities. Marketing, Manufacturing and R&D. R&D was a loss, so no part of the loss, since it is not carried out in India, no part of the loss also can come into India. Manufacturing was a profit, so the profits attributable to manufacturing will have to be kept out because it is not carried out in India. Only the marketing related profits in India will have to be taxed in India and it was arrived at 30% if I remember right. So that is the, uh, so profits attributable to 30% of the profits derived by Rolls Royce in respect of Indian activities was attributable to the PE and that profits were liable to tax as far as the PE is concerned. So now you see how the profit attribution takes place. The functions performed, what is the function performed by Mar uh, Rolls Royce India? Marketing, market support. For market support, if manufacturing has taken place outside India, if research and development has taken outside India, the profits or losses attributable to these uh, activities will not come into the accessible income of the prop, uh, prop permanent establishment. Only the accessible income is the ma marketing activity and that's all which can come as far as the taxable is come. <coughs> Over this customer is a nice decision. If I remove her right, it uh, also finally said only those, the last line is very important. While attributing the only those factors affecting such profits are to be considered. So again, you go into the attribution principle, only the functions which are performed by the PU look at and arrive at the profit. This is not the only decision which I would like to possibly look at is possibly consulting engineers. I, essentially, I have let us look at gold. Is this an important decision? Uh, it calls for, it is a divergence to the Supreme Court decision. Earlier we asked a question whether after earning an arm's length price for the agency PE, any more profit would survive for the PE to be taxed. That was the question we raised earlier. You find converges somewhere applying those principles. It says global income of the entity you find out from whatever the annual reports or 10K reports, whatever they file. You find the operating profits of the Indian operations by applying the percentage of profits in the global. If the annual balance sheet of the company in the US reports say 10% profits, for the Indian operations of sales, you apply the 10% profit and arrive at the Indian profits. Now the subsidiary has already been compensated on arms length principle because it is uh, it's performing the activities. So that is called the profit before tax for the Indian subsidiary which has been already arrived at. Now you could find the balance that is the operating income attributable on the principle of proportionate profits minus the profit before tax. So some kind of a residue profits has been arrived at in this decision. That is a profit 
beyond the arm's length principle has been computed in this particular decision. It essentially recognizes the concept that if you pay an arm's length price, that would not dissolve the profits in entirety. Some profit may still survive and that profit may have to be taxed in India in addition to the arm's length price which is paid. And why when I am saying India is universal, where the theory is located, you can look at it. So I would possibly urge you to look at this convergence decision when you get to some time and reconcile it with Morgan Stanley decision. One can say how can a lesser authority determine something new which was not there in the Supreme Court decision, it would possibly, but this decision has gone on deeper facts compared to what Morgan Stanley had in his set of cases. So you find the concept slightly expanded here. Consulting engineers is a more recent case. It says profits assume assets used and activities performance. It is exactly the power analysis which you do. The last three slides which I have, they are all going into the history of dates and events. They are not very important learning, they are not principles. It is a chronology of events as to how OECD evolved these principles from 2001 till 2010. The only concept which I would possibly leave a thought, which I have not covered in my presentation is, we are now entering an era of bets, base erosion and profit shifting. A base erosion and profit shifting possibly will not talk about attribution principles, but what it talks about is the nexus issue is getting narrowed down. Pre previously, preparatory and auxiliary activities were not construed as PE in many circumstances or in all circumstances. Now, some of the preparatory and auxiliary activities may get classified as a PE. As a result, the attribution principles to those preparatory and auxiliary services also may have to be formed. Then we are also evolving what is called the digital economy, how to tax it. There are no good recommendations in the web's uh, action points which are on digital economy. It has left it to the individual states to adopt what is good for them. So you may find two principles which may get changed in the future with the web's action plan. One, preparatory and auxiliary related services may be found to be a PE. If it is a PE, some more profits may have to be attributed for those activities. That is the first principle. The second principle is that digital economy is nobody knows how to tax it because there is no PE in most cases, so you won't have taxability. But no PE is not an acceptable situation to the global states across. So you may find certain touch points or nexus rules being evolved with regard to digital economy. If those rules get evolved, you may have to find a profit attributable to the PE in a digital economy which is currently unknown to the, the uh, methodology which is being followed. If these two caveats are unknown figures, possibly we have come to the end of the presentation. Today I ran it out a little earlier than what I thought I may require to do, but I will be happy to take questions. If there are some things which I have not covered, which you thought I must cover, please ask me questions. I will be too happy to clarify. Awesome. Sir, sir, in the case of convergence which you mentioned, they have basically given a formula to arrive at the arm's length price, right? So, let's say our arm's length price uh, earlier was 10, and as per the formula it is 12, then 2 they are attributing. So, same was in uh, earlier cases also of Galileo and others. Now, convergence I will distinguish with the Galileo. One is the, it says, Profit before tax, which is arrived in the subsidiary, it is not saying it's not the arm's length price. If it says it's not the arm's length price, then I will be with you. It's trying to arrive at the arm's length price, can be. What it essentially says is the profit before tax is disclosed, computed, is all fine. But this is how I will compute the profits this in an allocation program, proportion. So while the decision does not go thus far to say I am attributing a PE beyond the arm's length, the result of that is that they are trying to attribute some profit more than the arms length price. Though it is not expressly stated to that extent, it essentially goes to the level of saying that there is something more than what you have found as profit before tax. Basically they are arriving at the arms length price, right? 
and in Galilee almost 10 percent of the profit. Again, you are arriving at an arm's length price. Two no, Galileo, Galileo did not travel to find the profit beyond the arm's length price. This decision possibly goes to find the profit beyond the arm's length price. Okay. So, one thing. In Galileo, if the 10 percent profit was more than the arm's length price, no. right? if it was, as for the computation, they would have attributed more than the arm's length price in that also. It's not that in that way. It's not that quantum. <laughs> 10 could be 9, 10 could be 8. The question is whether something more than arm's length price is being attributed. 10 is the arm's length price, we are not in dispute. I think we are agreeing with each other. If 10 is the arm's length price, whether something more has to be attributed for the PE is what we are looking at. In my view, Convergis tries to do that by trying to attribute a little more using a global attribution uh, uh, proportionate formula and other things. It is silently stated. It, I would say it's expressly stated. It tries to say profit before I will find the global Indian operations profit, which includes P. It does not talk about Indian operations profit, it includes PE profits plus agency profits. So it tries to slightly, uh, it must be Pramod Kumar's decision, is what my guess is. Look at it. Mm. Yeah. So I am not for, it has not articulated so much, but essentially the point which is trying to do is that arm's length is not sufficient. Indian operations is, includes agency operation plus PE operations. You look at it that. Any other question? We have come to the third end. That's it. I, I want up too early. I will watch the norm. It's okay. If the PE distributes dividend, for example, hundred dollars pays as dividend. Seventy rupees, seventeen dollars has to be paid as dividend distribution tax. Can the holding company take credit of this DDT? No, no. P is, if P is a company, see if you are if P in a company situation can arise only in a dependent agency P. If the company, if a subsidiary is a dependent agent and it earns profit and it distributes dividend, 17 percent dividend distribution tax, US laws do not expressly allow uh, credit to be taken but it is permissible. If I, say that I have worked out first few companies where you can say that the dividend distribution tax attributable to the shareholding which the US company has in India. If it is X, you can possibly claim a credit. It may work well, it may not. It's an arguably good case, but there is no written law to support that. But if it is a Mauritius company, you get an underlying tax credit. There are many, UK possibly you may get it uh, as a credit also. But US is not an express law. So you may get it out of practical application of law. So I will say with the current law, with the dividend distribution tax, which essentially has a grossing up phenomena, that it will be treated as if it is an income in the hands. There is a grossing up which has been enacted from last one and a half years. With that principle, you may stand a better chance with the US because it essentially says it is a surrogate in the hands of the uh, uh, shareholder. It is a tax paid by the company. But the meaning of the section, if you keep reading, because why you could gross, it says the income in the hands of the uh, shareholder. With that principle, you will get a uh, credit. So, PE should be a company incorporated in India. Then only the dividend will come, otherwise it will not come. Company cannot be a PE by itself. Activities can only create a PE. You can create a company by incorporation, but activities only can create a PE. So, certain activities only can create a subsidiary to be a PE. One such activity is a dependent agency principle. A dependent agent can be a company and it can also be an agent. I have a completely different question now. Uh, I am not sure how the tax credit is taken by the foreign company for taxes paid in India. We don't give any form 16 kind of document. Uh, it's only a chalan we pay in India. Don't have to give. So how can they take credit for this amount? Is there any? There are two levels of documents. Now, normally, a document is not required. Books of accounts are adequate to show whether a credit has been 
given or not. Your, after all, made in some books to say so much of tax has been withheld in India or paid in India, and therefore you don't need a document. But for transactions like dividend distribution tax, which you will not have a document generated because you will receive only the dividend amount without the tax element. It may be appropriate for the company secretary to issue a certificate saying that the dividend distribution tax attributable to this much of dividend is so much. That may be a good document to have for the foreign company for credit credit. Normally you don't need a document. Most foreign countries don't demand a document as long as you show a return in India, a chalan in India, a certificate issued by the permanent establishment over the authorized officer. All these are good documents. You don't need a record. So Form 16 is the Indian uh, uh, stickiness, if necessary. We, we demand all these forms. Most of the foreign countries don't demand forms. Any other questions? Santoshji, I have not done anything which you wanted me to cover. I have covered it. Okay. That's it. I think we'll wind up. I'll not hold you all. Enjoy a good evening. Uh, if no one has a question, uh, since we have some time in our hand, I would like you to put some more light on the BPS concept. How it is done and how it, is, how it can be avoided? Bits cannot be avoided. Bits is to catch you. So what, what is the impact on the economy of the BPS? Two things will come in the budget possibly. The country by country report, which is one of the recommendations, it will come. That means your transfer pricing Twitter will enhance. Country by country report requires two sets of documents to be made. One is called the master file, the other is called the local file. The local file will describe the functions of the local entity or the local permanent establishment. The master file will be the global document or the which can be referred to anything which will be more like a policy document how to deal with the transactions. Both will be visible to all authorities, tax authorities. So Indian authority can look for the master file, you can look for the local file. So the functions and assets and risks which you are now evaluating, it cannot be in an isolated way, it has to be integrated to the master file. So your functions these are can be visible whether your documentation is complete or not. So it, rigor of documentation will have to be enhanced. So that is one aspect. There are quite a few aspects in the web section. And for example, uh, there are recommendations on interest reduction being restricted to uh, some amount of gross income. So was 100 rupees is your income. It says interest should not exceed say 30 percent or something. Uh, I would say these are income based restrictions. Income based restrictions are not superior. Yeah, interest is to be deducted based on leveraging, that's your debt equity. If interest is restricted based on income, then because capital employed can be different for different companies. So you have to recognize leveraging rather than income as the basis. So this is the second restriction. Uh, I can say of all the action points, you find the most difficult one or one of one, the procedural one of country by country reporting. Otherwise, it will all that. And uh, a little more, what can happen is, uh, they have talked about digital presence in the digital economy. So, uh, India is a large exporter of software or IT services. <laughs> If you say digital presence, where is the digital presence? It's uh, there in the countries in which the software is supplied. So, that may be a profit redistribution which can be a threat to the Indian companies. Understood? No. What is the norm, sir? I keep going. I can summarize also if you want. I can take another five minutes to summarize a few things. Take five minutes more, not more than that, I'll say. So definitions of PE. Definition of PE, I'll need another two hours. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that discussion today, we had a threshold that's called permanent establishment is required for profit attribution. The amount of profit to be attributed would depend on the activities of the permanent establishment. The activities of the permanent establishment will have to be measured in terms of functions, assets and risks, which would include people functions also. In computing the profits, 
you are entitled to reduction of expenses which are normally incurred for the activities of the bee. Positively, the expenses which are in direct relation to the activity would be allowed. Administrative and executive expenses would be allowed provided there is an allocation which is reasonable. Research and uh, development expenses would be allowed provided they are inextricably linked to the activity of the uh, uh, permanent establishment. Interest will be allowed as long as they are paid to third parties, they are not interest between the parent and the subsidiary. If the parent company borrows interest, borrows from a bank for running the operations of the PE, then the interest which is paid to the bank would be allowed in computing the income of the permanent establishment. But if the parent company has its own resources and makes available funds to the permanent establishment and says that this, for these funds I have made it available to you, I am going to charge an interest, that interest will not be allowed. So you will not get royalty deduction for the IPRs which are owned by the enterprise itself. Wherever royalty reduction is required, you may have to embed it in the price. There is the buying price and the selling price could include some element of royalty. So hidden royalty is permissible, transparent royalty is not permissible. Then you cannot charge management expenses, you cannot charge fees between head office and uh, subsidiary, uh, permanent establishment. You have the arms length principle or separate enterprise approach that is the permanent establishment should earn the same amount of profits as an independent enterprise would earn in similar circumstances. So that is the concept which has been evolved and which has been followed. If same profits have to be earned, you have to apply the arms length principle. Arms length principle rests on three factors, functions, success and risk. But assets in the context of a PE would include ownership related, related aspects. Uh, ownership of an asset is always at an entity level because ownership is a legal concept and therefore for the purpose of computing the profits of a PE, you arrive at an economic ownership concept. If the economic ownership is based on usage in the context of a PE, if the usage of an asset is in the PE, you will be entitled to all the deductions associated with the ownership of such asset. The deductions could be in the form of a depreciation or it can be in the form of running and maintenance of those equipment. Then you have got finally with all these concepts you have to allocate free capital. The permanent establishment from year to year will generate profits which are getting accumulated in the permanent establishment. If the profits are accumulated it will remain with the permanent establishment. So every year when you draw up the balance sheet, you will show the accumulated profits in the balance sheet of the permanent establishment. But if the PE distributes those profits to the head office, then certain countries levy a tax called branch profit tax and that tax is in addition to the tax on the profits which the PE would pay. In India, we do not have the concept of branch profit tax. We have a consolidated rate of 40 or percent on foreign companies. So if you have a separate branch profit tax, then the rate of corporate tax will be equal except that you will have a branch profit tax being levied on the amount of profits which are remitted back to the parent. You may have a dependent agency relationship where a subsidiary may also be a PE. So normally a separate associated enterprise is not a PE. Being an associated enterprise by itself would not create a PE. But if the activities of the associated enterprise is that of an agent and that is a dependent agent by law, then you have two relationships. One is an agency and a PE. A agency is normally compensated on an arm's length principle. Since the agency and PE are arising on the same activity, the question is whether the arm's length price paid to the PE is adequate to compensate the profits or something would survive or would not survive. There are divided opinions. The Supreme Court ruling in Morgan Stanley says that if the arm's length price is paid, no other profit would survive for tax in the country of source. But there are other rulings or international commentaries which are saying that if the arm's length price is paid, so be it, it takes care of the agency requirement. The PE may still have some more profits left which are not taxed and a little amount of contribution may have happened for that. It may not be equal to one more arm's length profit. It will be slightly more, but it's not that you have to really increase it by another 100% of the profits. And internationally you find that P and subs are equal. 
except that subs may have allocation of interest, allocation of royalty, you may have uh, allocation of managerial expenses, all those things as deductible expenses which are not deductible in computing the profits of a PE. With that summary, I think we can go back home that we have learned all the slides which we wanted to learn today. There's nothing, in fact, if I had said it in the past five minutes, we would have all done in the first five minutes. <laughs> On behalf of the Bangalore branch of SIRC of ICAI, I profusely thank CA P. Srinivasan sir for his wonderful deliberation on the series intensive workshop on international taxation with today's topic being on attribution of profits to P. So we are immensely enriched by your dissemination of knowledge from today's workshop. Thank you very much, sir. Now I request uh, CATS Subramanian to please come forward to hand over the memento to previous sir. So, as a token of gratitude, please accept this. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you.